Being Black in America comes with its challenges. However, we understand that enlightenment through education is the oppressor's worst fear. By bridging the gap between academia and the people, our purpose is to equip you with knowledge that breaks down barriers during your journey towards truth and freedom. Welcome to the Black and Highly Dangerous Podcast. Yo, yo, dad, what's up? What's up? What's going on? Uh, nothing much. Uh, getting prepared to go back in the field. I have had a awesome two weeks at home in Illinois. Um, and now it's time to get back to work, you know? Nice little break. Now, now it's back to getting grind mode, I see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We went to go see Hamilton, like I said. How it, was that? It, it was good. It was good. I won't lie, though. I was a little irritated. It's, it was some people in front of me, like... A man and a woman. Uh, and you know how seats, theater seats are made to where like you're like right in the middle of two people so you can see the. Mm-hmm. Well, they decided that they just wanted to, to like cuddle and kiss and their head kept like blocking my view. So I was mm-hmm. petty and I like I pushed myself all the way up. And I like was like right there in in their space. Like they look back like, what? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm right here. It it didn't stop them, but I was still able to see them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just sit down and watch the show, people. You got to do all that, that extra stuff, man. Like, yo, it's a two or three hour show. You will see this person afterwards. You do not have to do all of that. Yeah. That's funny, but the play was good itself. Yeah, it was good. It was funny. Um, the music was really good. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I'm gonna have to check it out one day. I actually be today. I'm actually gonna go see um, American Son. Oh, nice. Uh, the nice. It's like a limited time play with Kerry Washington. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I saw Gabrielle Union tweet about it last week. You know, it's it's only till open to like January, so we're gonna check it out today. So I'll let you know how it is. I think opening weekend was just last weekend, so. Okay. Should be good. Should be good. That should be enjoyable. What else you been up to? Nothing really. Just, you know, looking forward to taking my break. <laughs> looking forward to Thanksgiving, I guess, in a couple of weeks. I'll be at a conference this week in Atlanta. Okay. Um, then, okay. then I guess the new week after that, next week is Thanksgiving week. So so looking forward to that little holiday break. Little yeah. Space. It just turned November. Why is next week already? I know. And like, yo, this is so weird. I'm yo, like, no, man. Slow down. I'm yo, not where man. I'm supposed to be with data collection. Slow down. That is kind of wild. It did turn November, but it's about to be December as soon as you blink your eye. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, so we got some uh, Oh Lord news popping off this week. Of course we do. All right, let's get into it. Hello. And welcome to BHD News, where we give you the most current and eye-opening Oh Lord News of the Week. Join us as we present news that'll make you want to say... Okay, well... Our first Oh Lord news story, you know, is is kind of sad, but it, it goes back to one of our topics that we had during the summer um, about gun control. Um, last week, we had our 307th mass shooting. It took place on the 311th day of the year. That is almost a mass shooting for every day of the year, almost. Mm-hmm. It's 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 so crazy, it's so sad, man. Like I don't understand how people, politicians, don't understand that this is a a huge issue. You know, the gun violence and something needs to be done about it. Yeah, and yo, my my new senator, Marsha Blackburn in Tennessee, she was interviewed on Fox News and was like, when they asked her, like, what what do we do to you know, you know, address this issue, and she was like, you know, well. We, we really have to think about how we're going to protect people's Second Amendment rights and how we're going to protect people. The, so the first thing she said was how we're going to protect the Second Amendment rights. Not, you know what I'm saying? Uh, people were second to her. No, we need to understand we protect these kids, these college kids and everybody that's dying, man. Like, forget about the stupid amendment. <laughs> like, everybody worries about the amendment. Nobody is trying to take, we talked about this when we did that episode and we covered it, like, 
Mm-hmm. It's really not about the amendment. You can make adjustments and it doesn't affect the amendment at all. So I don't know why politicians are still tripping about the amendment so much. Because, yeah, the, the guy that did the Thousand Oaks shooting, I think he had like an Ill- illegal like magazine extension, whatever you call it. There was something illegal about the gun that would make it more deadly. Yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I w- I just want to say the saddest part about this shooting. Um, well, I won't say the saddest because it was sad, but like, I would say the craziest thing about this shooting is that one of the victims actually survived Las Vegas's mass shooting last year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was, that was actually a country music festival. And come to find out that this was like a country music bar where people go to enjoy country music. And he and his friends survived last year, but he did not survive this year. And I just want to read a quote from his mom. His mom, uh, in a tearful um, plea um, with the news, said, my son was in Las Vegas with a lot of his friends and he came home. He didn't come home last night and I don't want prayers. I don't want thoughts. I want gun control and I hope to God nobody sends me any more prayers. I want gun control. No more guns. Damn, that's so real. It's so real. Like, I don't want your prayers. And to to say, I pray to God, you don't send me any more prayers. Like, she mm-hmm. meant it and she just hung up or she just got off after that. Like, she was like, nothing else to say. Yeah, we want. She wants action, and the fact that in the, in the it's just crazy that you survive one mass shooting. You think that's a once in a lifetime event? Like, oh, you know, I'm thankful to get away with that. Probably won't ever happen again, and then find yourself in the midst of another one, and this time you don't make it out. That just shows how frequent they are, and how we got to stop acting like this is like a you know random doesn't happen that often. Three hundred and seven and three hundred and eleven days or whatever. That's come on, it's once every day. Yeah. And I won't lie, like I do, it's so it happens so often and it happens in all types of communities that I do think about my safety when I'm like at mass events, when I go to the movie. Heck, when I even go to Walmart, like my friends laugh at me, but I go to Walmart with a fanny pack that has my ID, one credit card I need and my key so that if anything pops off, I'm ready to run. You get what mm-hmm, I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And like, it's crazy that I think about that, but I, I legit do because people are crazy. No, nah, it's real. It's sad that we got to actually have to have these kind of like, I don't know, these emergency gun emergency kind of uh, protocols in our minds. Now, I know like even as teaching, you know, I constantly think when I'm in the classrooms, like, OK, if something were to happen. What would I do? You know, even just to, just so if it did happen, I wouldn't be caught off guard. I mean, like, I don't know what to do in these situations, what the X's are, how would I approach the students? And even like I had a conversation with my parents and my dad is going to be speaking with like all the men in the church on on Sunday and really talk about like protocol of like what to do if somebody suspicious comes into the church or, you know what I'm saying? Or, you know, kind of protocol, what to do with the women, the children, how to get everybody out there and exit. Cause now you have to really address these things, you know, cause certain populations are being targeted, whether it's in synagogues, places of worship, mm-hmm. people where they're just music festivals. And so uh, it's a sad, sad such a time we're in right now. Yeah, I agree. Um, and we we can't. So, you know, all of that, you know, has political implications, like I mentioned, my senator. But, you know, we can't get away from this. Oh, Lord, news segment without talking about the election. Mm-hmm. Got to talk about that. OK, so this is a crazy story. So in Arizona, state representative elect, she's a Democrat. Her name is Raquel Tehran. Um her opponent has just filed a lawsuit challenging her citizenship without any evidence. Because they lost, they now want to challenge her citizenship in court to try to take the seat from her. Wow. Come on, man. Just take the L. Just take it. Like, oh, you, you're such a sore loser. Yes. Um, also, oh, Lord, news. Speaking of sore losers, there was this petty, petty judge in Houston, who lost his reelection. And so the next day he went into court and released nearly all of the ju- juvenile defendants who appeared before him, as long as they answered no when he asked if they planned to kill anyone. What? Yes. So he asked them that question. If they said no, he pretty much released them. Some of them were violent offenders. Um, 
if he didn't release them, then he rescheduled all of the cases to the first week that the new judge would take the bench. What? Which That's was a petty. Democratic woman. Yes. Very That's petty. So petty. And of course, who who first of all, whoever gonna be like, Are you gonna kill somebody gonna be like, Yes. Right. <laughs> <Come> right. <on. laughs> <laughs> oh man I, I mean yeah that's that's so petty i don't even know yeah um and so the the big new or the big question last week was was there truly a blue wave you know did we truly make a difference and you know although you know some big seats hang in the balance and you know some people lost that we really wanted them to we cannot lose sight of the fact that like our turnout, Democratic turnout, Black turnout, youth turnout was huge. Yeah. It was amazing. And I feel like that deserves a yes, Lord, a, a thank you, a <laughs> pat on the back, all Round of, of that. <laughs> and the reason it should be pointed out that the reason that we didn't see, because we, we took the House, but the reason that we did not see the changes that we wanted to see in the Senate is because of gerrymandering. Listen to the statistic. Democrats received 12 million more votes in the U.S. Senate than the Republicans, yet they still lost. Mm. 12 million. That's crazy. Just like we had the popular vote for presidency in 20, 2016, but still lost. Gerrymandering folk. Goodness gracious. That's crazy. Yes. That's, that's wild. Yes. Uh, we're gonna have to, that's going to have to be addressed within the next couple of years for sure. Yeah, it got to be addressed because the minority is deciding for the majority and not even a small majority. 12 million, that's a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big gap. You know what I mean? <laughs> we can't got to take that serious. And this is supposed to be a democracy. So it's supposed to be just majority, majority rules. But because mm-hmm. of the way the gerrymandering and stuff. Yeah, you're right. The minority is getting more say and that, that should not be the case. Yeah. And also in blue wave. So like we have talked about in the past, the importance of local elections, the importance of local politics. And there were actually some really great changes um, from the voters at the local level, even if you didn't see. So although Marsha Blackburn won a Senate race in Tennessee, in Nashville, voters passed a measure that will create a community oversight board that monitors police departments. And that's amazing. You know, even though the election in Florida hangs in the balance, um, they restored the voting rights of felons who have served their time. And I think that's like 1.5 million people or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, honestly, that's the difference between potentially Gillum winning, you know, outright in a landslide and not. You Mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm hmm. That's big, folk. That is huge. In Louisiana, um, they actually passed a measure that will require felony convictions to have a unanimous jury. Previously, it only needed a 10 to 2. But, you know, this actually makes sure that when we are convicting people, we are doing it really beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. I like to see these criminal justice initiatives and, and, and things getting passed with the law. Um, I think with the whole, the releasing of the felons thing, allowing, being allowed to vote, reinstating them, I think that's important because I know DeSantis, well, whatever, you know, he was a big proponent opposing that. Mm-hmm. So now that these, six, I think it was like something like 65% of the Florida voters voted in favor of it. And so now it's like, okay, even if he wins, he's going to be in a tricky situation. Mm-hmm. he for can't really re-election. win them votes yeah, <laughs> for that re-election baby like, nah, bro, you wasn't you wasn't about us now we here so now it's gonna be easy for whoever opposes him in the future or whatever you know that's gonna be it's gonna be a tough uh demographic for him to land yeah and and that's pretty much it's kind of like that was the light at the end of the tunnel or like the bright light for me it's kind of like they won't be in control for much longer and i hope that we as people as citizens you know are really paying attention to the tactics that they're using to try to suppress the vote so we can counter that in two years so we can mm-hmm. counter that in four years when it's time to vote dissenters out of office if the recounts um goes in his favor mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But it's kind of like, you know, I I did not feel the same way I did after the 2018, I mean, 2016 election. Mm -hmm. I feel a little bit more hopeful because of all of these measures that have passed, including Michigan, where they now uh, allow uh, recreational marijuana. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, all of these measures where people are making their voices heard, even if we didn't win the big election. So it's a lot. It's a lot to be hopeful about. Mm -hmm. Yep, we've got the House back. So that's good. Got these big measures passed. So that's good. So, I mean, there's a lot of good things. It's showing the direction that everyone's moving in and a lot more people just paying attention. Mm-hmm. And, and the younger folk are being more active. Now, what I would say is that looking at one particular demographic, I'm still disappointed in. Oh, child. <laughs> you know, still, I'm like, you're not going to fool me. Y'all not going to fool me. Still ain't learning a lesson, but white women, man, oh. still out here voting not in their best interest. You know, it's just, it's still confusing me in a lot of ways, but. Or we're going to ask what their interest is. Because we so. make assumptions. Uh, what what was that we just talked about last week uh, with Dr. <laughs> Fields? Like we make assumptions about people's interests yeah. based on the demographic. I but yes, they letting us know what their interests are for real. Yeah, the, these agendas that uh, oppress women too. Because child, the, the Department of Human Services just quietly passed a measure that would allow employers to. Um, pretty much not cover birth control if they don't want to like it expanded like the list of reasons oh, yes, or like that. weakened you know what it means to have like a, a religious objection like now you can have a moral objection and you can pretty mm. much deny women birth control i mean this goes beyond abortion birth control is used for more than birth control it's, it's used for a lot of conditions that women have um so it's just kind of like Maybe that is their interest. Some some handmaid's tale type stuff, you know? I guess so. Cause I mean, clearly, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know what the I forgot what the saying is, but they definitely showing us who they truly are. You know? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> when when somebody showed you who they are, believe them. Yeah, believe them. I mean, this yeah. is it. I guess, I guess yeah. I can't fool myself no more. Oh man, it's just so interesting to me, you know. Especially when you see people coming out, especially right before the elections, like like Chelsea Handler and um and what's the uh, comedian's name? I can't remember. Amy Schumer mm-hmm. and all of them, you know, trying to get on the right side or say the things. And it's still those numbers still show like <laughs> they make no difference. <laughs> yeah. But that just means we have to mobilize more of us, more of the people that are willing to, you know, get out. When I think you said it last week, when more of us vote, you know, we have the better election outcome. So it's kind of mm-hmm. like just know we cannot depend on them. Yeah. Even if they say it to our faces, oh, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yep, just trusting ourselves. Do not believe the hype or trust anybody else because they'll lead you one way. And then after elections, we'd be all surprised. Like, what happened? Now we know we can't count on none of them votes over there. <laughs> <laughs> none of them votes. Oh, man. Um, but yeah, I mean, so going into today's topic, you know, uh, post-election um, and like with a lot of initiatives that have been passed, And these agenda items uh, brings us to a topic talking about uh, criminal justice innovation, Mm -hmm. uh, dealing with uh, particularly specialized courts and community courts in particular. And so we had the opportunity to interview an amazing judge, Judge Victoria Pratt, who headed the North Community Solutions Community Court in North New Jersey. Um, And the work that she has done there has, you know, not only been very effective in the community, but has caught national attention, where she has uh, been invited all around the country for a keynote talk. She has a TED talk out that we have a link to as well um, mm-hmm. on the site. So check that out. And um, the work is really innovative where they're not using prison or jail first. They're actually being involved with the community in, uh, uh, building a rapport with the community members and using alternative measures to make sure that people actually are getting the resources they need. So it's pretty cool. I, I agree. A uh, very good conversation. And, you know, uh, the epitome of what it means to show care Mm -hmm. in the court system and the implications of care for recidivism and for 
respect for the law you know yeah. even if you don't win just showing a respect for the law when somebody shows respect for you so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, very yeah. good conversation yes i mean it's it's good i mean it's a judge you know so we get to get a lot of insights and it's just compassion from the bench a lot of the times the judges are the ones dueling out the punishment and giving these people these life sentences so it's actually to see you know to see that hey things are changing around and a new perspective when it t- comes to like approaches to criminal justice so um, she definitely shares a lot of good insight and we know you guys have learned a lot from this mm-hmm. for sure mm-hmm. alright well other than that you ready to get into it dad let's get started I will right, we'll catch up with you afterwards research on procedural justice suggests that when court users perceive the justice process to be fair they are more likely to comply with court orders and to follow the law in the future regardless of whether they win or lose their case Today, we have an in-depth discussion about the implications of procedural justice and what it means for judges to show respect by interviewing Judge Victoria Pratt, a nationally acclaimed judge and professor at Rutgers Law School. Judge Pratt TED Talk, How Judges Can Show Respect, has over 1 million views and has been translated into 11 languages. During our interview, we discuss her experiences as a black woman judge, the importance of care and empathy in the courtroom, and the role that race plays in problem-solving justice. Today, we welcome Judge Victoria Pratt. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited about our conversation. No, thank yeah. you. Yes, yes. Um, so the, generally, the first thing we like to do for our interviews um, and our interviewees is just to have you introduce yourself to our listeners, tell a, a little bit about your background, kind of you know, your journey to where you got where you are today. So I am the former chief judge of the North Municipal Court, and when I started my career as a judge back in 2009, I started in traffic court. Um, I realized that I wanted to be a judge when I started seeing people as Cory Booker, then mayor of the city of Newark, came in and began to appoint these folks. And I thought, what an awesome position to be in, which is the ground level of courts where most people, most people will only see the misdemeanor court in the United States, but to be in a position to kind of talk potential into their lives. And so I pursued um, a judgeship in New Jersey. You are not elected, you are appointed. So I was able to convince Mayor Booker, then Mayor Booker, now Senator Booker to appoint me. And I started off in traffic court and it was a funny time. I always say that my Chief Judge moved me because um, it was right after a recession and people would be like, oh, I can't pay. And I'm like, ah, take six months. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and people don't typically want their tickets, their uh, traffic tickets paid because your traffic courts end up being your revenue generator. And that's not what I got on the bench for. And so I ended up um, being moved to part two criminal court. Now, the North Municipal Court has a very interesting or had a very interesting relationship with the community. It was known unaffectionately as the Green Monster. It's on 31 Green Street. And the conditions of the cell block were so poor that maybe 20 years ago, there was an order ordering the police department to pretty much shut down the holding cell. And that didn't happen maybe until two or three years ago, they finally um, shut down. The cell. So there was this idea that, you know, you would go to this place that was the Green Monster. So justice was contained in the Green Monster as well. And prior to coming to the court, I, I served as the attorney to the, municipal, to the municipal council. So I did a lot of community work, not realizing that I wasn't just going there to be a lawyer. And then I get on the bench and I start seeing the community that I know. My mother was a beautician in the city of Newark, had a shop, and I spent my weekends and after school taking rollers out, but really being in Newark, also Newark at the time, was the the home of art. So being very familiar with this community and it really meaning a lot to me to be able to serve in this space. And I one day, my chief judge at the time told me that I was going to be moved to part two criminal court, which was the worst court in the courthouse. And actually, some public defenders told me that it was probably the worst court at the time in the state because mm. it was full of the low-level offenders. Um, the, the volume of people that come through that court. Um, in the city of Newark, we have about 26 
agencies, police, law enforcement agencies that write tickets and summonses and complaints. So if you live in Newark or spend a lot of time in Newark, your chances of encountering law enforcement increase, obviously. Mm-hmm. And so you just, at its peak, Newark Municipal Court had a, had about processed about 500,000 cases. And so it's also a transit hub. So you have the Newark Airport, New Jersey Transit, you have the bus system, mm-hmm. you have the ports. So you just see a lot of people and a lot of different kinds of people coming to the court. And part two was the place where when people got arrested, you got to see them the following day. And it was every judge's nightmare. We had to work there one day a week, when, like every 10 weeks. And the judges who got sent there, they knew that they were being punished. They knew that this was hazing. And you sent staff there that you couldn't get to work well with others in other places. And even... The prosecutor and public defender's office, it was a forced rotation through there. And so I get into this space and realize that something has to change. We were fortunate enough that we were just waiting for the Newark Community Solutions Program to come around, but it got submerged in this arraignment court, which is different than where it is in some other places. Community courts usually sit standalone places where you can just kind of establish a culture. So now we're in this space. We're in the Green Monster. We're in this terrible courtroom. And now you have to change people's minds on both sides about this court. Mm -hmm. And so North Community Solutions was the, the idea is that if we can provide alternative sentencing for folks, we can provide assistance with punishment. Mm -hmm. And not that people shouldn't be held accountable but that their crime, their punishment needs to be commensurate with the crime. Mm -hmm. And we weren't seeing that. We were seeing um, people who were getting fines and would get picked up, so they'd get a fine, and then in two weeks when that fine was due, we were giving them fines and we knew they couldn't pay them. And when two weeks when that fine became due, a bench warrant issued, and they got arrested. And so not only does it disrupt your life, but it's this idea that we we were on this conveyor belt of justice and we couldn't do anything about it. We wanted, we would see a person who needed drug treatment and we wanted to be able to do something about it. You would see a young person who was just trying to find themselves and you wanted to do something about it. So when uh, the mayor, then again, Cory Booker at the time, and the municipal council created this partnership with the Center for Court innovation, certain central court innovation, and the judiciary where we could actually, in fact, provide these alternatives. One of my favorite things about community courts is that they require the community to be involved. You are using resources that already exist in the community. So in Newark, when they first got there, our nonprofit, we created Newark Community Solutions to be a nonprofit agency that would sit inside the court and provide services immediately a person would be arrested they'd come through my court and before they even got to me the prosecutor had been given recommendations about this might be a person who's in need of assistance based on their record so someone the, the court coordinator had already reviewed the file had already reviewed their cc agents like listen this person's got a lot of possession charges Potentially, they need to go through this program so we could get them the assistance. And then they'd also talk to them. But it also gave the public defender, who oddly enough, they were um, a little resistant. And I'm, I was always surprised by that um, because they're trained to get their folks to go home. My job is to get my client released. Mm-hmm. And um, they would now have an alternative. Like instead of your client just having these signs converted to, um, to jail time, we could now take these signs and say, you know what, we're going to let you work this off through community service and social services. So I'm going to make you help yourself so that you can be a better member of the community. And I'm going to send you to a community provider that's in your neighborhood or that's in another ward, but you might already be familiar with them. And when you're done with the work that you have, that you have to do for the court, you now have this community provider that can take care of you. And that but for but for the fact that you were compelled to do it, forced by the court, you would have never gone there. You would have never gone to the church that actually has a drug treatment program and takes people to detox for free on Mondays. 
had you not been sent there to do community service and been forced to have that conversation. So for us, it was a, it, it was a great opportunity to really begin to look at sentencing in a way that was holistic. We then got our, um, our health department involved. And so imagine that being sentenced to like, you have to go to the mobile van that comes in front of the courthouse or city hall because you've had this knot on your head for seven years. And sometimes you black out and don't know what happened to you because you've never been to the hospital for this injury that you have or whatever the the, the symptom could have been. Mm -hmm. And so we began to do this. So then the court while people were initially reticent and distrustful of it, they started realizing, I went to court and I can go to jail. Instead, I got some help. I, I, I was sent to a food bank to, to stuff bags, but then at the end of it, I got a bag of veg, fresh vegetables to take home. And this food bank is here and available to me. Um, I had to go put mulch down in a community garden. And this is a abandoned lot that drug addicts use and it's full of syringes and I get to clean it and now it's this viable place like there are vegetables in there that I touched and I planted and so what that does for folks who now live in the community and see that these abandoned lots now become these places for vegetation that not only can they get food but the seniors in their neighborhood as well but that they've actually put some effort forward mm. to make a change and again, these are the people who are seen as a nuisance in the community, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. that's why we have these quality of life, quality of life uh, offenses are about people who annoy you. And they, that's how legislators come up with them. Oh, drinking in public? I don't like to see that. So we're going to make this an offense. And it also gets criminalized because the person will be subject to 30 days in jail. And then if they don't pay their fines, well, now they come, they become a part of this criminal justice system that we have as a result of these um, nuisance laws as well. When, in fact, potentially what we may have needed to do is to apply a, a social justice approach to the guys who hang out every day drinking alcohol and on the stoop. Mm -hmm. So uh, the problem-solving justice, uh, the problem-solving courts really allowed us to do that. And then they also allowed us to get folks more engaged in cleaning their community. There was one older guy, who maybe, and I shouldn't say he was older, maybe he was in his 60s. And I was asking him about community service. And there was, again, a, a lot of a, a, a garden. And I, I have to tell you, I was a little reluctant because I'm not a big nature person myself. Mm -hmm. And I was like, these folks are from, we, we live in the concrete jungle. They're not going to be into this garden business. Mm -hmm. And he was in a lot and he was cleaning. And I said, well, how was he? was like, well, Mr. Maybe Mr. Reed. I was in my neighborhood and Mr. Reed saw me. And when I was done, he asked me, what was you doing? He said, oh, I was doing my community service. And it becomes community service for Judge Pratt. And he said, really? Huh. And Mr. Reed said, well, stand right there. I got something for you. And he went into his house and gave the gentleman a jacket because he didn't have a coat. Now, Mr. Reed saw this young man grow up in this neighborhood. He went from being a drug dealer to becoming a drug addict. And so now this guy has become a drug addict in this neighborhood that Mr. Reed has seen change. And there was something about seeing this man that he saw as a kid outside doing something to restore the community through this garden that made Mr. Reed want to reconnect with him and give him something. And the sense of pride that this guy in his 50s, or maybe 60s, like I said, had in telling me, and he was wearing the coat that Mr. Reed gave him. And I was like, look at that. Because you did something that helped Mr. Reed see your humanity again. And it's not that Mr. Reed doesn't know it. He's just disappointed in what has happened to his community and what was a young man in his community. And so seeing those kinds of things, and like this is really what restorative justice is about, right? Because a victim, drug addiction, is not a victimless crime when it impacts the community. And so he being able to go back and give 
back by doing community service and beautifying that part of the neighborhood really helped restore Mr. Reed, who was seen as a victim of his drug addiction in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And so these things make sense. And I think so much of what we need to begin doing in the criminal justice system is taking a common sense approach to justice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think restorative justice helps us do that. No, that's true. And, um, you know, definitely sitting in these courts myself and witnessing the different approach and the innovative approaches compared to the traditional aspects and, and practices of courts and courtrooms and court settings. You know, this is definitely something unique. But even going along those lines, right, um, I think some and there's been, I think, somewhat pretty much two kind of points of criticism. I kind of want to get your take on this, right, because there is a lot of good that's associated with these courts. But then some people also argue that, you know, there might be this kind of net widening effect um, that we're because we're focusing more so on these quality of life offenses or smaller offenses and getting more people into the system that way, um, that it's going to maybe have some detrimental effects because maybe these people in a traditional court setting might have just been overlooked or maybe they're, uh, you know, it might have just been dismissed, if, if at all. And then some others people argue, too, on top of that, that um, and I've seen in a couple of articles talking about things like maybe it's these courts are a little more coercive in nature than other courts, right, because they're kind of encouraging people to get these resources. But in many cases, you have to get these resources. You have to plead guilty um, to qualify or to get mandated and things like that. So what would you speak to some of those criticisms about these about these type of courts? Well, I mean, I've heard them. I mean, and the reality is, is that my court was both a traditional court and a community court, correct? Because it was a, it was an arraignment court. If people didn't want to do community court, they were sent to the three other criminal courts that were open and operating at the same time. In Mm -hmm. Newark, we had 12 sessions a day. But the reality is that these were the same people that were coming through the court all the time, getting jail, all the time, Mm -hmm. getting jail. And it was just a matter of time before they got their jail. They got jail on the day that they got arrested for the quality of life um, offense or for the not quality of life or the um, criminal offense that uh, the disorderly person's offense that they, whether it was drug possession or wandering with the intention to purchase or sell, they would get that offense. So they spent, what, a night or two before they got to see a judge to go home. Many of them would say, oh, I'll just plead guilty and then I get to go home today. But you still have this thing hanging over your head because the second you don't pay your fine, you're coming back before a judge. And so the judge can either revise that time payment or give you jail. And sometimes you would see files of people who had been arrested and then before a judge, judges attempting to do what they had um, tools to do, which was revising time payments five, six, seven times. But that still meant that the person had been picked up by the police officer, went to the precinct, potentially stayed there for a couple of hours, then was brought down to the to the courthouse to spend the night and then got released the next day. So we're looking at two to three days of um, jail time that in a traditional court is still happening. And at the end, at the point that someone finally says, you know what, I'm not revising this time payment anymore. I'm going to unsuspend your jail sentence that's on this file, and that's what you get. Then they get their entire jail sentence for something that got imposed or that they were talked into pleading guilty to but let to go home the first night. So ultimately, I think that we were doing, we've were doing we been doing a disservice by not trying to correct the behavior that brings people before the court. And so while people mm-hmm. talk about what, uh, net widening, the only option most courts have to this day is probation. Mm-hmm. And even giving someone probation is an opportunity. It, it, it's seen as this is my opportunity to help you. But then what happens at probation? In Newark, um, the probation officers have between 100 to 150 probationees appointed to each probation officer. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's a lot of people. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of people to manage it. That's a lot. And you're not just talking about folks who don't have issues. You're talking about people with mental health issues, people with serious drug charges. Um, You know, I like to call them young people at risk for greatness, but that are focused on the other stuff. So who are getting in trouble. 
that is a, that, that's a lot of folks to try to focus and wrap your arms around. And so all of these systems, of course, are concerned with calendars and how you're managing your calendars, how are you disposing of your cases as well. So I find that in that context, there's even incentives to kind of close out cases and violate people. And so what happens, and everybody learns the game. In North, the game was you got on probation. It took probation maybe 90 days to violate you. 90 days. You've never shown up. You've never done one thing. Maybe it took them 90 days. Let's say it took them 60 to 90 days to send a violation into a court. Now, and it also takes them between 40 and 60 days to do a drug evaluation, which means we're going to do an evaluation to see what type of drug treatment you need. Mm. Now, a person who has a drug problem who might want to get assistance, you have to give it to them then, like now. I want to go to TFAP. Okay, let's go. The, two days is the longest you might have to wait. Mm. You get out of jail and you wait 45 to 60 days to speak to a counselor about what type of drug treatment you have. That person is lost. You would agree? Mm-hmm. That's a long time. Mm-hmm. That's a long time. The person would then get revised. They'd get um, re-instructed to probation. And then another violation would come. And then ultimately, they would end up getting their jail time. So... You know, I think that ignoring the fact that we let people leave without helping them is worse than any net widening. Mm-hmm. Because what the system traditionally does is hold people accountable for behavior that we haven't tried to correct or rehabilitate them. And in fact, we've added something on top of the behavior that further aggravates their situation, which are money fines. Yeah. And they walked in, they just, when they walked in, they were just a drug addict, right? Mm -hmm. Now they leave and they're a drug addict with, in New Jersey, the Dieter is $500. Mm. The mandatory fines are about $125 plus the $33 court cost. Did you hear me say fine yet? I haven't said fine yet because I still haven't even imposed the fine. Wow. And these are all low-level offenders. Mm -hmm. So what are we looking at? Or a drug addict who just walked into court and they got to go home, absolutely got to go home. But what do we know about a person who's addicted to opioid? If they have five dollars, that's going into the system because that's what the disease does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. So, um, you know, before we get into talking about innovative court justice, I actually want to hear. Um, I want to hear more about your experience as a woman of color in your profession and, you know, if you encountered any challenges um, and advice you might have for women who, you know, want to be on the bench and pursue a career path like you. Yeah, I don't. That's a funny. It's funny how you kind of frame that question, um, because I don't think you even have to ask whether I've encountered challenges. I I think the focal point is what do you do with the challenges, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) You you know, you try to be objective and, you know, but yeah, I feel you. (laughs) You you need to expect them when you come in, Mm -hmm. but be prepared to manage how you're going to do them. So I, I think that one of the mistakes that we make as people of color is sometimes we go into environments And we forget that we're there because we have our own secret sauce. We have our own experiences. And we should be using that to add to the conversation. Because what we definitely know is that when you have people with diverging views on an issue, that's the way to get the best answer. And so I had to be very clear about who I was and what I was going to do, no matter what was happening. People thought I was nuts. Why are you talking to those dirty people? I couldn't even imagine that you would say something like that about another human being. I wasn't raised that way. You know, I was raised that you treat everybody as if they're one of God's children. And I wasn't afraid to bring that person to the job. Mm. I wasn't afraid. I mean, the people said, I just think people are silly. When um, Mayor, then Senator Booker was trying to make me a judge, people protested. Wow. And they, one of the things someone said was that I was too little. I was too nice and I was too little. And yeah. I thought, what kind of foolishness does that yeah. say about somebody? 
I'm not trying to get on a ride at an amusement park. I'm trying to get <laughs> become a judge. Yeah. And they never say things like that about men. They never talk about how little men are. But what they were trying to say is that I couldn't, people wouldn't respect me, that I would have no authority because of my dress size. And I would always smile and say, the only thing small about me is my dress size. And <laughs> the reputation that I developed in Newark was Judge Pratt don't play. And I laugh when I say that because it was, it, it's actually a sign of respect. And what was most important about it was that defendants made sure they told other defendants. They prepared them mm -hmm. before coming to me. People would tell me, oh, I was on the bus and they were talking about you. Listen, don't mess with the judge. Do everything she says and it's going to be all right. So now the community is helping itself. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is that they wouldn't have said that about me if I were male. And people wouldn't have been consumed with that. They should have been talking about my legal acumen, my, my temperament. You know, wh whether I was going to bring something to the bench that was necessary. And so I'm bilingual. I'm a this Dominican. My father's African-American. And I brought that. I mean, one of the running jokes was that it got so bad about people mumbling in Spanish underneath their breath about me that the public defenders had to go back there and like, listen, don't say anything. Because <laughs> I would address people, you know, people would say something. And I'm like, okay, and all of a sudden, you don't understand English. You understood English the last time you were here. But now there's a penalty. And we would laugh about it. But I could hold people accountable because I already know. I already have that experience. So I think so much of um, what I did was bring all of who I was. You know, I got a young person from the Dominican Republic who was facing immigration consequences. And my question to him is, what are you going to do in the Dominican Republic when you get deported? What skills are you going to bring when you get deported if your behavior doesn't change? Um, Young men, uh, it, it, just all of those things, my own experiences. Um, also, the fact that I understand um, how young men and the police department might engage because of that experience as a, as a black woman in this country. And I would often say to young men, listen, your job is to get home after you encounter law enforcement. And if that's yes, sir, no, sir, you do that. And then you go down to internal affairs and report them if their behavior is out of, is a violation of your rights. That's what you do. You have the right to use that as recourse. Mm -hmm. So I think that people, and it's easy to say be confident in it, but know that the work that you're doing requires it. There's a reason why you've been called to this space to do this work. And to trust that, you know, to trust that voice that's inside of you that says, do this, even though people mm -hmm. don't understand. Mm -hmm. Because for so long I was in there and people were like, this judge is nuts. What is she doing? <laughs> Until one day a judge said to me, you know, I drive down Elizabeth Avenue, which is, you know, some of the uh, tougher projects and drug addiction, the prostitutes are on the other side of it. And he said, I see people at eight o'clock in the morning running to the courthouse. He said, and I know they're coming to the courthouse because they have these green folders. And the green folders are the folders people get when they're in their community solutions. And he's like, I used to be a public defender. They were my clients then. And they are up. They, well, they, clearly they're up at seven, but they're outside at eight o'clock in the morning running to get to the courthouse on time because they know that you require that of them. Mm -hmm. So, I think being able to speak to them in a way, um, and also, as I say, uh, I know what things in Newark look like, so you can't run a game on me, and letting them know, and not being afraid to do that. No, 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 that street doesn't go like that. Mm -mm, stop. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. how that's important, you know, uh, and why it's important. No, so you were in the West Ward, and I was in the Central Ward, and you're telling me it was snowing in the West, and that's why you couldn't get here? Cut it out. And so <laughs> you begin to develop. But I think that also comes from my cultural understanding of this community as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I just think that it's so important. And it took me a long time to learn that. Um, I think law school at one point also taught us that, you know, everybody should be homogenous. You should look a particular way if you want to get a particular job and be thinking. But I knew that my 
purpose in life was to be of service and that I couldn't serve people if they didn't understand me, mm-hmm. if they couldn't relate to it, mm-hmm. that they were, I couldn't, I couldn't shift their behavior. So I, I think that that's one of the major things. Um, we also need to know what our communities, people of color, what our communities look like and not just assume, oh, cause you're a person of color, you know what this community looks like. So what I spent a lot of time, even as a judge is I tried to remain connected to the community by talking to people who were in the community. So we would have, um, we would have our gang intervention person and I'd have lunch with him. I'd sit down and talk to him. Tell me why this happened. Why does this happen? When, why do the young men look down when I'm talking to them in court? I have difficulty getting them to look me in the eye, and I feel like it's a little disrespectful. But then I get an explanation from somebody who works in the community of young gang members. And so I needed to understand that, right, so that it wasn't ego, but in fact, I now understood those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. So I think that as people of color, we can't be afraid to talk about what we know that's different than what other people know either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I don't know if that that resonates with you, but if you know what I mean. No, it does. It absolutely resonates. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes you don't want people to know, but I know why they do that. I know what this means. Why when a person says that? There were times I'd be in court and the officer would say, no, Judge, that means this. And I'm like, oh, okay. But it's an important conversation to have and not to be afraid to add to the conversation just because you've had an experience that someone else hasn't had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's real. I feel like um, even, you know, times I've observed you in the courtroom, definitely being understanding the community is, I think, something you you hold and stand by pretty strongly in a lot of ways. Um, You know, I think one particular case that has stood out to me just thinking about it uh, was a young guy. He came in and I, he was, he was, I think he, I can't remember everything, but I just remember he was like, it seemed like he was getting into some trouble where people were shooting at him or whatever. And, um, and he came into the courtroom and then I remember you kind of put him in, uh, the holding tank or whatever in the back uh, for whatever reason. And I kind of was caught off guard. I'm like, Oh, you know, what's going on with this? This guy clearly just talked about, he got shot at and all these other things, but your approach on surface seemed like it was like you were trying to punish him for whatever had happened. And then afterwards we had a conversation and, and you had mentioned one of the reasons you do that is because you understood the community that, that he was running from a situation and you didn't want to put him back on the streets when his life is being threatened in that regard. And you gave it an opportunity for him to have some space and also to talk to people to figure out if anything can be done to help him and help keep him safe. Um, using, you know, whatever powers you had to be in that moment, understanding that. And I was like, that's powerful because If a judge, you know, if you didn't know that and you put him right back Mm -hmm. out into the streets or right back into that situation, you know, it could have it could be a situation where it's a terrible ending for that young man. And so just, yeah, understanding how the community operates, like you said, sitting down with your gang interventionist personnel and things like that and just really trying to get the full context of what goes on in these people's lives to make sure that you are doing what's best for them and also the community at large, too. So I think you know, that's just one of the situations that, that stood out to me. And it really speaks to, to your philosophy and how you approach the bench at, at Newark, Newark NCS. Mm-hmm. You know, that's an interesting example that you brought up because um, that tells you how much power we have to change what the court is. Um, that young man had a parking ticket that he was in, the, I think he was in our program. He was in our program already. And there was one ticket that he didn't tell us about, so we weren't able to recall the bench warrant on it. And he had been running and hiding in the same community. Someone had put up bounty on his head on Facebook mm. for like a $1,000. Wow. And he came to court, went up to the clinic, and he spoke to them, and he spoke to his public defender. He was like, I got to get off the street. Like, I, I, I got a bench warrant. I need to go to the county. Like, they're going to... And literally, the issue was that he was concerned that he was so tired from having run so many days that he was eventually going to be... He was like sleeping sitting up at the McDonald's. It was very, it was the first time I had ever ex- experienced something like that. And he had a bench warrant outstanding. And his public defender was like, we are asking. And, and as a team, they got together. They were like, he needs to go to the county jail. He has to get off the street today. 
and literally they were able to work it out so that he could, um, when he got out, to um, get on the bus and go away. Um, but yes, what happens when you send people to community service in parts of a, of a city that they can't go to? So either they don't show up to community service, they won't get out the van, or now you have somebody who's violating their probation, right? Because now they're not going to community service and they're definitely not going to go do the community service because they could be shot. And so having an understanding. So when I see that violation or when the person comes, I'm like, why didn't you go to community service? What's wrong with you? <laughs> You're doing everything of it. Like, I can't be in that part of town because of a beast. And I'm like, and beasts, as you know, change all the time. Now, I'm saying, as you know, not because um, I think there's some expert um, <laughs> in, you know, when gangs have beasts, mm-hmm. but they change. They And, and, and anything... And, and so, Doctor, I have to thank you, though. I really need to thank you, and I wanted to start with that, even though we're past that, because your presence in the courtroom really made a difference. And also, the work that you do with our young men, that you volunteer your time, it was an answer to a prayer I had almost seven years prior. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, No, it really was. A young man came in and said, and I'm trying to get him to think about what his other options are other than trying to be a drug dealer because he's no good at it because I know him so well. That's a sign. <laughs> the judge knows you well. It's because you're not good at doing this. And, right, you know, college is an option. You have four colleges in this town. And he looked at me and said, ah, I can't go to college. And I'm like, why not? Guys from North Dakota College all the time. And he looked at me as if I were lying. He said, I've never met Nobody, no man from Newark who graduated from college. And my heart sank in to my stomach Mm -hmm. because clearly that is why he could not see that as an option for himself Mm -hmm. because it wasn't his reality. Young men from Newark don't go to college. And so I started looking for men that I could send the young men to, but it was clear that they needed to be talking to other men, that they needed to sit down amongst themselves and talk about and and actually correct a lot of the misconceptions they had about themselves. So as you know, I started um, giving them the essay, Black Men Disappearing from Society. Mm -hmm. And what was fascinating about it is that they would read this essay, again, New York Times, Charles Rowe essay, and it's written on a collegiate level. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about themselves. Like they're like, wow, I didn't know there were numbers to go along with this thing that was happening to me. And they began to see how they were also playing into some of this stuff that set up. And so the fact that they come back to court and they have a session with you and I'm like, I was, you know, and they're giving me faces and uh, I'm I'm bothering them because I'm talking to them, you know, and they want to be cool. (laughs) But then I asked them, and then you have, you know, the ingenuity to call it the fire next time. Mm-hmm. And so how was the fire next time? How was the group? And their whole disposition changes. And I was like, ah, oh, that was, well, what, what do they say? Oh, that, that's, what, that's what's up. Mm-hmm. And I was laughing. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so for the record, could you please? No, it was really good, Judge. And you get young men who are in different sects of gangs, different parts of the city, different gang members. And they sit in this group with you, talk about how they feel, go beyond the time. I'm walking out of the courthouse, and I'm like, why are you guys still here? (laughs) Because they're not done. They're not done sharing with each other in a place that's safe. And that that place that's safe is at the courthouse. Mm -hmm. Mm. So I really want to thank you. No, I really want to thank you. And more um, people who have the opportunity to do things like this should. Mm -hmm. Because you really... if you really don't understand how much, like, like, you can say something that resonates with somebody and it changes their whole perspective. Everything in their life changes because of this one thing that they, this one thought that they never had before. Mm-hmm. And so that you take time out and you come spend with them is also, it's just huge for them. Mm-hmm. It's just huge. So um, I want to thank you for doing that. Mm-hmm. And, and, just listening to you judge like uh, just thanking you like the amount of like yes. care and love yes. that like you show to people from the bench it's amazing like we need that 
all over the country, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, that was great. Great. Just watching watching you in action definitely was just one of the, you know, as far as doing my research and schooling, all that kind of stuff, but getting into the field, you definitely giving me the opportunity to sit in and just learn and watch and see how these things operate was not only eye opening, but you know, it 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 it, it lit this fire with inside me like you know what i want to do more than just write papers you know um and mm-hmm. you just ca- having that as a judge having that door open for somebody that you know not just to observe you and do research but also saying hey well you're welcome back here anytime you know and that made it so much easier uh to 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 transition into ncs and help out and start the group and 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 work along those lines so i definitely am, am very grateful for that for that as well you're but I'd, I'd like to tell you that I, it's actually the invitation was even stronger than that. These are your guys. You're responsible for them. Come do something about them, right? Mm-hmm, pretty much. <laughs> These are your children. Come do something about them. You want their behavior to change? You change and give them some of your time. Mm-hmm. And I have spent some time working in um, recently with this organization mm-hmm. that works in Pelican Bay. And I got to tell you, I call prison, the prisoners to task like you guys are sitting up here being revered in your community revered you have an obligation to tell them how horrible it is to live in here you have an obligation and there's the story that i tell them about um the bullhorn elephant i won't get into it but it talks about how what happens when you take bullhorn elephants away from which are the male elephants and you take the baby male elephants away from them and after telling the story, one of the young guys, I mean, everybody's tattooed in jail. I'm like, it's like they have a tattoo shop in jail. I don't know. In the prison, I don't even understand how you get tattooed. <laughs> but this young man was waiting for me, and he came up to me, and he said, you know, I um, wanted to thank you for that story you told because it really touched me. And I went back on the yard, and I told the homies about it. And I thought, wow, he's like, not only did I do that, I called back home. And when he called home, the person who was talking to him was really just talking to him about, I guess, how there, how there's this void because he's in prison and they don't have leadership. I don't know, leadership that would do what he used to do. And he said he started yelling at the guy and telling him that, you know what, we've got to change. We got to start mentoring these young people. Mm. And I'm like, that's what you told him? And his community ended up having a barbecue the following Saturday for the young people to raise some money, I guess, for a park or for stuff to to start mentoring them. And I looked at him and I said, understand that's how much power you have here, right? Mm -hmm. You have this power to influence mine. What you going to use this for? For a criminal enterprise or to save your community and stop seeing these young guys like you come to this place. So for me, I think it's just so powerful when people tap into that thing that they're supposed to do. And I don't say that they can do, but that they're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. That they're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, no. that's, just, um, that's what I got. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I was wondering, I I know you're a very busy person, you have places to be. So, you know, are there any closing words you'd like to share with our listeners? Um, anything that we didn't address that you really like for, for people to hear? Did I answer your question about as a woman of color? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, you did. did. Yes, yes. Very well. Oh, I do want to make this point about restorative justice. Okay, so I think one of um, the reasons we have to change our view of what we're doing with the criminal justice system is because we ha- it has to start making sense. It, it, we, we, ha- we haven't punished, rehabilitated, or diverted people from crime using this law and order model. We haven't. What we know is that the people who are sitting in our prisons and our jails have experienced, and not just them, but the people in our communities have experienced significant trauma, significant trauma. And so much of the criminal behavior or behavior that we see that violates the law in courts, 
reveals past hearts. We know this. We know that this person lost their father or this person who's in a gang saw their mom shot in front of them while they were a child. And we did nothing to deal with that trauma. And so now we wonder why this person can be so cold and pick up a gun and then shoot. Well, this has been their experience. This has been their normal. And understanding that. And so with these restorative justice models, we acknowledge that this violation of the law or this harm has created a tear in the fabric of the community and that the people, the person who's been harmed has to be restored. But so does the person who's offended. Now, when we talk about these things, people always say, oh, what about the victim? We do this. I do this work because of the victim. Because it's nice to give somebody 10 years in prison and then release them to the same community where the uh, victim is, right? And if we sentence the person harsher than the actual offense, now we've made the offender a victim themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. So applying these restorative justice models brings the community back into the process of saying, you, create, you harmed me, you harmed us, you broke the trust that we have in this community. This is how you fix it. Mm -hmm. And it also gives the victim an opportunity to hear, I'm sorry. And even if they don't hear it, they get to assert their power to say, I forgive you even if you don't ask for it. Like, so we, we, the current way the system is, we're hijacking the whole process from the victim. And then we don't give the victim an opportunity to be whole again. We don't give them an opportunity because we say, oh, you're a victim. You know, the difference between a victim and a crime survivor. Well, you want to be a crime survivor. That's what you don't want to be a victim. Mm -hmm. And then this person walks around with this mark that this thing happened to me. And then they feel vulnerable as opposed to this thing happened to me. I dealt with it and I used this pain to empower myself or other people. So, again, I've been talking about low-level offenders. Yes, there are people that have to go to jail, to go to prison and not come out because they can't live amongst us. We know that. And, and, and that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about the folks who got rounded up and sent to prison and criminalized through our prison and jail system. And not to forget, our jails hold most of the people who are incarcerated. So I think that we also begin, need to begin to focus on misdemeanor courts, because that is where most of the cases are filed and where most people are jailed. Even if it's, as I say, even if it's the 30, 60 days at a time, they're sitting there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Well, Judge, we know you got to run, uh, so we appreciate, you know, you taking the time to Thank talk you so to much. us. Um, is there anywhere people can find you on your, if they want to keep up to, you know, what you're doing, your speaking yes, engagement, social yes. media? Absolutely. So I'm Victoria Pratt on Facebook. I am Judge V. Pratt. One on Twitter, Judge V. Pratt on Instagram, and please check out my website, www.judgevictoriapratt.com. It's a very and nice website. Check out my, um, TED Talk. Thank you. Yeah, it, is a, it is a very nice website. <laughs> and, <for> please, sure. <laughs> and please make sure you click on that TED Talk, even if it's a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make sure we do that for sure. Um, all right, well, we appreciate you, Judge, for taking the time and, uh, you know, definitely great conversation. I know our listeners will gain a lot from this and gain some exposure from what problem-solving justice is and restorative justice and this kind of new approach to our justice system while we're all looking for reform and looking to make our communities a lot better. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, and thank you for the work you guys do. I mean, it's um, they're, they're, um, people are selfish with their time, and you guys use this as a platform to talk about issues that impact communities that people probably wouldn't otherwise hear or pay attention to so um any use of your time to improve society i, I just want to commend you for all right dad so what you think about judge pratt joining bhd it was so cool like i, I mean i can believe she's a judge but like she's just so I, I don't know. I just felt so like it was like such a welcoming interview, if that makes any sense. Like, I, I felt mm -hmm. like I knew her. 
Yeah, you know, she always give me just like every time I talk to her, see her, like she's giving me these auntie vibes, like you know, <laughs> <laughs> like I'll, I'll, I'll be one. I call her Judge Pratt, but I be wanting to call her Aunt Pratt, man. Like, What's up, auntie? Yeah, you know? like I, I just felt like I knew her. Um, so I just appreciated the interview, and you know, kind of like I mentioned uh, toward the end, um, I think the work that she does is it's simple in the sense that. Yeah. Respecting people, um, you know, treating people with fairness, uh, showing people that you care. That's simple, but mm-hmm. it's so profound because so few people practice that in everyday life and probably definitely not in the judicial system. So, you know, that was just it was, it's heartwarming because regardless of what people do, the mistakes that they make, you know, they want to feel humanized. Um and they they want to feel like they have a fair shot, even mm-hmm. if things do not go their way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I like that. I, I hope it's a concept that people can uh, practice in everyday life. Just explain things to people. Talk to them. Um, and maybe we can, you know, see see differences in how people interact with each other. Yeah, no, I mean... It's right headed right on there. I mean, when towards the end when she talked about restorative justice, you know, one of the key components of restorative justice is really trying to not label people as bad people, right? It's like the act you committed, we don't condone or is a bad act, but you are not a bad person, right? Mm-hmm. And like you said, it really it really keeps that 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 factor like, oh, this you're still a human, right? You're still a person. Um, and not forgetting that in all these kind of interventions and resources, I think in the criminal justice system, we're just so quickly to say oh, you're a criminal and discard people and forget that they are actually humans as well with a story, with a narrative, with a life and understanding how we, how they got to that point will do us all the, the greatest service, you know, so it mm-hmm. won't happen again. Mm-hmm. Um, and and one thing about, uh, you know, procedural justice, too, and this is I'm glad, you know, she talked about things like race. Is because even just like with my own research or even in conversations, I feel like procedural justice, they a lot of research is quantitative in nature. Most of it is quantitative in nature, but a lot of it um, really discards this conversation of race, mainly because it doesn't come up significant in the models. Um, And I just feel like I just have an issue with that because we know race and racism and inequality is so pervasive in the criminal justice system in all facets. And then we know that even dealing all, you know, punch of research shows that dealing with interpersonal, just like communication and like you said, relationship kind of skill sets, you know, race plays a factor in that too. So I just have a really hard time believing that race is not a factor even within procedural justice when you're trying to build a rapport when you're trying to connect with people um and i'm glad she kind of highlighted that that just from her being a part of the community understanding the community even working to do that more uh really helped her connect with defendants and and get them to services as well and i think that's um, something that should be explored a little bit more you know when we mm-hmm. had these conversations. Cause I just can't believe, you know, I just can't believe that race doesn't matter. I just, can't you know, it, it's, so it's making me think about like all the social psychologists that we've like interviewed, you know, mm-hmm. it would pr- pretty be pretty cool to like, look at potentially like implicit bias and, mm-hmm. um, like those are like uh, procedural justice approaches. Like even if you're trying to do it, like what role does like uh, implicit bias, implicit racial bias potentially play in like how well it works? Mm-hmm. That's an experiment for you, Ty. Somebody should, yeah, we got to link up. I got to link up with a social psychologist. We got to make this happen. Okay, because were you about there. to say somebody can do it? Nah, you can do it. <laughs> link up with a social psychologist. I know, but, yeah, let me put that on my research agenda and link up. <laughs> and get, some, get some pubs out there. Yeah, I'm still trying to get this tenure, so. Let me not yeah. be just giving away projects yet. <laughs> um, go ahead, you say something. Uh, no, I was about to say, did I ever tell you that I was a teaching assistant for a restorative justice class? I think you did mention that before. How was that? It was good. Um, and like you said, like you said, and Dr. Uh, Judge Pratt said, it really helps you reframe um the way you think about the uh like you know 
survivor, not even a victim, but you think about like you are a survivor of something. Um, and like you said, reframing the way you think about uh, people who have committed a, an offense. And I think it privileges uh, when we think about like um, restorative justice or procedural justice or, or like humanizing different aspects of criminal justice. I appreciate how we privilege people. So it's people who have committed an offense or people who have done this because they are at the end of the day, still people. And I think um, just the, the goal of trying to restore the harm or try to actually address the harm that people feel rather than like just focusing on the punishment, I think it's a really powerful tool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not all about punishing. It's about, you know, restoring, right? Just going back to that key, the root word of of the practice. And, uh, you know, in closing, you know, I think that Judge Pratt, you know, you, for, for all of you, check out her social media, check her website. You see that she's been receiving a lot of national and international attention for the work that she does. And uh, I would say that even having conversations with her, she, you know, she asked me, she's like, I don't know, you know, what I'm doing that is causing me to get us all this attention. Like she's just doing who, who she is as a person is all she brought to that bench. Um, and she doesn't feel like she was intentionally trying to do things massively different. She just wanted to try a different approach. And I think that's important because even witnessing and observing her in the courtroom, I mean, one, it was always fun to watch because, you know, she just always made sure to engage with the defendants. I mean, she would be even very careful as far as recognizing changes in their appearance, right? Like if somebody would come in and have their hair cut and if they were homeless, but she would notice that she'd be like, Oh, Mr. So-and-so, I, I see you got your hair cut, you know? And then you can just see that person's demeanor change because the judge noticed them, right? And noticed their appearance. And even just those little things, I felt like go a really went a really, really long way as far as, you know, building rapport and just getting be able to connect with defendants in a different way instead of you just in other courtrooms I sat in, I seen judges just never look up at the person and never may even make eye contact and just look at the sheet. Okay say their ruling, move on to the next one. Um, and so I don't know, it's just it's just extremely fascinating and we definitely appreciate all that she has done in the courtroom. And I remember too, she didn't, she mildly addressed it in the interview, but I remember seeing this a lot in the court is that she did, um, I, I, not race didn't play so much of a role in the courtroom for her because pretty much all the defendants were, were black or people of color. But I would say that like gender, and sex played a role a lot. Um, she took it very seriously for like defendants to make sure she, they did not call her Miss Pratt. Mm. Um, and she would always correct them like, no, I'm Judge Pratt. Right. And then I would ask her about that. And then she would say, you know, she wanted to but she felt that she wanted to make sure that they respected her the same as they would a male judge because she said they never call male judges Mr. They always say Judge so and so. Mm. And so anytime somebody said Miss Pratt, Miss Pratt, she's like, no, Judge Pratt, Judge Pratt, and correct them. And sometimes it would be off putting. People like, what? I don't understand why. But she was always like very conscious of like reinforcing that, um, which I think is is something worth mentioning as well. You know, from from her experience. Put some respect on her name. Put some respect on that name. Hey, you earned that judge shit. Don't play. <laughs> Don't play. Shoot. Cory Booker put it there too. Don't forget that. He might be president one day. Who knows? Actually, I was like, <laughs> I'm happy that, you know. He took her um, desire to be a judge, like, seriously, and also didn't listen to the haters trying to protest and, you know, try to, like, you know, use sexist rhetoric uh, against her, you know, bid for becoming a judge. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Trying to say she was too small. Like, what? Come on, man. I don't know. She said, ain't nothing small about me, but my <laughs> dress <laughs> 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 oh, that's funny, boy. Lo love Judge Pratt. Appreciate her taking the time to come talk with us. Uh, hopefully you all got something out of this conversation. Again, we're doing this for you all. You know, as always, continue to follow us on social media at BHC Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Email us at uh, bhcpodcast at gmail.com. Visit our website, www.blackandhighlydangerous.com. Um, continue to share us with your friends, your family, and your enemies. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear. Mm -hmm.
If you're interested in continuing this and other conversations, visit our website, blackandhollydangerous.com to subscribe to our email list, suggest topics, and participate in our discussion forums. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at BHD Podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe and rate our podcast on your favorite platform. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear.